Wow, this is Dogs and Cats Living Together Mass Hysteria. Two movies, back-to-back, -back, double review. Well, if this is how the studios want to release them, this is how it's going to go down, then let's do this. So it was spring break, schools were closed, and what happens? I get clobbered with a double whammy. So first, there's a new Ghostbusters movie, in case you haven't heard, in case you haven't already watched 200 reviews of it. It came out the weekend before, and then Easter weekend was another Godzilla movie. Yeah, so it's Frozen Empire and um, the New Empire. So it's been a very um, Empire kind of theme. So anyway, I'm thinking... Oh boy, everybody's going to ask me about Ghostbusters and everybody's going to ask me about Godzilla. So, boom, Monday morning, right off the bat, I look up the show times. The earliest I find is a noon screening for either. I do Ghostbusters. Tuesday, a noon screening of Godzilla. And now I saw them both and I'm ready to rock. So first, let's talk about Ghostbusters Frozen Empire. I really enjoyed it. Uh, some things I say here could be considered spoilers, so I'm going to err on the side of spoiler alert. Here we go. In a nutshell, I think it's a great follow-up to Afterlife. Afterlife did its job by introducing a new, younger cast and finally bringing back the original gang, even though it was extremely abrupt and at the very end. I'll always remember back in the 2000s when Dan Aykroyd was talking about making another Ghostbusters movie with the old cast passing the torch onto the younger cast. And after so many rumors and false starts, it was like a miracle when it finally happened. It was a shame they couldn't have made it back when Harold Ramis was still alive, but like the Titanic arriving, it's better late than never. Who would have ever thought we'd see Bill Murray playing Venkman ever again, let alone twice? It makes you wonder, why is all this happening now? Also, before the movie, there was a Garfield trailer. That's right, a Garfield trailer before a Ghostbusters movie. The garfield Venkman bill Murray connection never goes away. Frozen Empire could have gone two ways. They could have been like, well, we passed the torch and now it's just going to be Paul Rudd and the kids. I would have accepted that, but they chose to keep the original Ghostbusters involved, which is commendable because in Afterlife, they were thrown in last minute. Frozen Empire corrects this. This time, the original gang is more a part of the plot. This time, it makes more sense for them being there and their screen time is spread out evenly. Venkman doesn't show up until the final act, with the exception of an earlier scene where he's testing the telekinetic abilities of a certain character. It's a minor thing, but in my opinion, since they put the Venkman stuff mostly in that final act, they should have used somebody else for the telekinetic scene. Uh, that way, his appearance in the doorway of the firehouse would have had a much greater impact. The one thing Afterlife definitely has over Frozen Empire in regards to the old cast is that Egon, Harold Ramis, is there in spirit, quite literally. So in a sense, it brings the original four Ghostbuster characters together one last time in a very heartwarming kind of way. The whole movie of Afterlife was a tribute to Harold Ramis, and there's a lot of emotional content that is not there in Frozen Empire. There's nothing that gets you teary-eyed in any way. The only thing that comes close is a brief moment I remember when Winston is scolding Ray, saying they're getting too old for this or whatever, and that was a pretty good moment. Ray is featured very prominently, and Dan Aykroyd looks like he's having so much fun with the role. You can see the look of delight on his face, and whenever he's explaining how paranormal stuff works, knowing that he's actually really big on the subject makes it even more entertaining. He is in his element. I love how Ray is hosting a YouTube show and he's surrounded by all these occult books and haunted artifacts. It's great. Annie Potts is back as Janine, who finally becomes a Ghostbuster, like in the real Ghostbusters animated series. She's very much an essential part of the original cast. I do wish Sigourney Weaver and Rick Moranis could have been in there as well, but I know it's hard to get everybody back. The most surprising returning cast member was William Atherton as Walter Peck, the guy you love to hate. Now he's mayor. Now wait, hang on. When did that happen? Who elected that guy mayor? Anyway, he's back to the usual business, messing with the Ghostbusters plans. It's a welcome callback that I didn't see coming. The standout performance from the young cast is McKenna Grace as Phoebe, the granddaughter of Egon. She plays it just as great as in Afterlife. 
Overall, I can't decide which movie I like better, Afterlife or Frozen Empire. Each have their strengths and weaknesses. The plot in Afterlife was very much straightforward. Uh, it was more character driven, or at least that's how it felt to me. Frozen Empire is more busy. There's lots going on. Phoebe's befriending a ghost. There's an orb that contains a spirit. There's a whole plot about the ecto containment unit filling up. There's an evil enchantment on an audio tape, much like Evil Dead. Lots happening. Uh, that's not to say the original Ghostbusters movie didn't have a complicated plot. If you want to talk about the whole thing with the gatekeeper and keymaster, it can sound rather absurd. But in the original, none of it ever felt like exposition. It was covered up with all that comedy and you never had the time to think about it. But in Frozen Empire, it feels like you're getting a lot of explanation all the time. There's a scene in the library with Pat Oswalt, which is very entertaining, but it's like the old trope where... You stop everything and let's tell you the whole story. I do like that there's a new villain, Garaka, who freezes New York under all that ice. So it doesn't have to be Gozer all the time. Uh, remember how many villains there were in the real Ghostbusters? It was endless. But I think the problem in Frozen Empire, if I were to pick any one problem, is that I think there are too many characters. I suspected this could be an issue with having the old Ghostbusters and younger Ghostbusters all together. It might get too cluttered uh, because think about it. You have all the kids, which is plenty. Then you have Paul Rudd and then you have the old Ghostbusters, including Janine. And then they felt for some reason that wasn't enough. So on top of all that, they add a superhero character. And that's exactly what it is. A guy with fire powers. Yes, because fighting ghosts with proton packs isn't enough. So they needed someone with fire abilities to fight the ice villain. He's played by Kumail Nanjani. He's really good in the new Twilight Zone and many other films, but I just don't see the point of having a superhero character when all the Ghostbuster characters, young and old, should have been enough. I felt the interaction between the old Ghostbusters in Afterlife, even though it was brief, was actually closer to the chemistry they had in the original 1984 film. It's a hard thing to replicate, and it was back in the 80s, man. That was a long time ago. But it can't be overstated how funny that original movie was. Even I kind of forgot. I probably went close to 10 years since the last time I saw it, because it's one of those movies I saw so many times that I have it in my head. I felt like I didn't need to see it again. But recently I rewatched it and damn, it holds up. It's all about that natural chemistry between those actors. And even in Ghostbusters 2, some of that chemistry carried over. Obviously now it's pretty hard without Harold Ramis, but the comedic tone of these new movies is very different. Paul Rudd reciting the lyrics to the Ghostbusters theme song, or Kumail Nanjani flicking a lighter at Garaka. We're not getting any of the same type of spontaneous comedy. Uh, I don't think it's possible to recapture that same lightning in a bottle, but perhaps if they allowed a little more time for improvisation and gave more space for Bill Murray to goof around, maybe they could have gotten closer. Slimer was kind of expected, but what I didn't expect was how close they returned him to the original character. They actually made Slimer a little scary again. It's hard to remember, but that first scene where he attacked Venkman was pretty terrifying seeing it as a kid. So I like what they did with Slimer. So the reason I bring up all the old nostalgic stuff is just to say, as a Ghostbusters kid, I appreciate it. With Afterlife and Frozen Empire, they gave us what we wanted. I thought the original Ghostbusters canon was long dead, but it's nice they delivered. Overall, I enjoyed both films and I'm happy they did it. Now, get ready for Beverly Hills Cop 4, Twister 2, Beetlejuice 2, Gladiator 2, Spinal Tap 2, Alien, Mad Max, Karate Kid, anything that ever existed is getting another sequel. We are living in very weird times right now. Now, let's talk about Godzilla x Kong, The New Empire. So, the timing of this movie is a little bit unfortunate because didn't we just get a Godzilla movie? It was this past December, but it feels like it just happened. Godzilla Minus One was a masterpiece. That's very hard to follow. 
So here's the best way I can describe this. If you've gone to a metal or rock concert, or can at least imagine seeing an opening band that's just amazing and blows everybody away, and then the main act comes out with higher production, giant LED walls, maybe there's some pyro, all that, but the actual performance and the content behind it just pales in comparison. Don't get me wrong, it's still a lot of fun. Of course, this is part of the American Godzilla series, the MonsterVerse, and it's a follow-up to Godzilla vs. Kong, which came out in early 2021. That one came out streaming the same day as theaters because, of course, back then things weren't quite normal, but man, I loved same-day streaming. I wish we still had that option since getting out to a theater requires a lot more planning and unless it's something the whole family wants to see, well, gotta wait till the holiday's over. Streaming versus theaters is a subject for another day, but these past two MonsterVerse films are a perfect case in point. That's the reason I bring it up, to highlight the fact that the experience was different. With streaming, I'm in my own lair, I'm more comfortable, I can start the movie anytime I want, especially if I'm reviewing it, I can get started early in the morning. And while I'm watching it, if I see something that gets me excited or some observation or thought that I wanna write down, I can pause the movie, that way I can write it down without missing a second of the movie. That's how I give it my all. Uh, this time it's in theaters, so I'm just working off memory, which is fine. It's just a different way to do it. See the movie, and then I write the whole script afterwards. So it's two different experiences. It's an important topic. It's worth mentioning. But everybody's different. Everybody has their own uh, preferences. So what's happening in this film? Once again, I'm going to give you a spoiler alert just in case. Here we go. Kong is still living down in Hollow Earth, exploring this new uncharted region, which brings him to the villain Scar King, who's almost like an evil Kong, who's the leader of a hostile army of ape creatures. Makes me think of Kingdom of the Planet of the Apes, which I'm looking forward to because all these new Planet of the Apes movies have been amazing. Anyway, Godzilla is on the surface, laying the smack down on other monsters while absorbing radiation and becoming a new, glowing, supercharged Godzilla. And then there's the human characters, the Monarch team, who are investigating the source of a signal coming from Hollow Earth, which leads them into the mix to help out with the good monsters. The human characters leave much to be desired, but it's not trying to make a serious drama or anything. This is a check your brain at the door kind of movie because they know you're here to see the monsters. So they deliver exactly what's advertised. With that said, uh, Gia is still a very charming character. She's the one from Godzilla vs. Kong who talks to Kong with sign language. That's all lighthearted and cute, so it has that going for it. But the real stars are the monsters. Kong is definitely the protagonist. He's the one who gets the most screen time. I like how they got his personality down pat. There's lots of facial expressions and body language, so you can always tell what he's thinking. So definitely Kong's personality is a big A plus for me. Godzilla also has some interesting behavioral traits, some of which I've never seen before. He goes to sleep in the Roman Colosseum. As soon as I saw that, I immediately thought, that's what my cats would always do. They'd walk around the house, and if they felt like taking a nap, they would just look around and go, right there, that's a good spot. It's funny, and it's also totally believable, because if there was a giant monster in real life, it would probably do the same thing. There's definitely an abundance of other beasts like Suko, who's a cute little ape-like creature who Kong makes friends with, and then Mothra makes an appearance, and I'm always happy to see Mothra, but it, it felt kind of like she was crammed in last minute. There's also an ice monster, Shimo, who Scar King controls, and this is where it drew a very strange similarity to Ghostbusters Frozen Empire, which I'm sure was a complete coincidence since these movies were being worked on separately and simultaneously. But there's a scene at the beach, much like in Frozen Empire, and the ocean freezes over. I was sitting there thinking, holy shit, this is some major deja vu. And there was another deja vu moment where they destroy the pyramids. Uh, can you recall what movie I'm talking about? Um, especially when Kong gets this robotic arm and there's a shot where you see the robot hand like coming up behind the pyramid and clutching it. If you would have taken a screen grab and showed me that one shot, I would have said, 
That's from Transformers Revenge of the Fallen. Again, I don't believe that was intentional, but it does make me wonder, are we running out of landmarks to destroy? We should start keeping a tally and see what's left. I really did enjoy all the scenes when they're in the cities and anytime we see human-made structures getting wrecked because that gives us the proper sense of scale of the monsters. When they're in hollow earth, they're just in a big fantasy world, so I don't find those scenes quite as interesting. I like the cities as the battle stage. That's my personal preference. With the monster characters, it's kind of nice to see them trying out new villains like Garaka and Ghostbusters, because we've seen Ghidorah and Mechagodzilla and all that. It's kind of like the Batman movies, like how many versions of the Joker and Catwoman do you need? Uh, maybe it'd be a good idea to see Gigan eventually. I always liked Gigan if they ever go that route in the future, but they should try to invent new villains. I would personally like to see a, a movie called Godzilla vs insert new monster name that we never heard before. Just like all the films of the 60s and 70s, it was always Godzilla versus this, Godzilla versus that. It was always a new monster. I'm not sure what the general public will think of this. If you're looking for a really good story with substance, then you'll be disappointed. But if you just want to see monsters fighting and all that good stuff, then you'll have a good time. There was a very young child in the theater, many rows behind me, who was making all kinds of noise. It was rather annoying, but I was more interested in trying to gauge what the child thought of the movie. It was a mixture of cries and random yells, so I couldn't make much of it. Uh, they probably didn't care too much. Anyway, this is a fun monster mash. I'm really proud of Adam Wingard for taking the helms and continuing the monster verse. So if you want a popcorn action flick and don't want to wait till summer, this delivers. Anyway, I just want to sign off by saying I'm honored that anyone would want to know my opinion on these movies. I mean, the fact that uh, you'd think of me is still a, a big deal to me because there's probably hundreds of other YouTubers who review these movies, maybe even like thousands, and some of them get early access to these movies. Um, I don't know how that all works. Uh, I, I think you have to live near LA or New York for that. I'm not sure. But I still feel honored and privileged to know that there's certain movies that people want to know what I have to say. I'm that Godzilla guy and I'm that Ghostbusters guy for better or worse. Hope you enjoy the movies and the review. Got to get back to working on Nerd and a bunch of other projects that I'm also very excited about. See you soon.